Good morning. This reading is from Whispers from Eternity by Paramhansa Yogananda. This is entitled, My Guru. <clears throat> thou light of my life, thou camest to spread wisdom's glow over the path of my soul. Centuries of darkness dissolved before the shafts of thy luminous help. As a naughty baby I cried for my mother divine, and she came to me as my guru, Swami Sri Yukteswar. At that meeting, O my guru, a spark flew from thee, and the faggots of my God craving gathered throughout incarnations, smoldered and blazed into bliss. All my questions have been answered with thy flaming golden touch. Eternal, ever-present satisfaction has come to me through thy glory. My Guru, thou voice of God, I found thee in response to my soul cries. Slumbers of sorrow are gone, and I am awake in bliss. If all the gods are displeased, yet thou art pleased, I am safe in the fortress of thy pleasure. And if all the gods protect me behind the parapets of their blessings, yet I receive not thy benedictions, I am an orphan left to pine spiritually in the ruins of thy displeasure. O Guru, thou didst bring me out of the bottomless pit of darkness into the paradise of peace. Our souls met after years of waiting. They trembled with an omnipresent thrill. We met here because we had met before. Together we will fly to his shores where we will smash our planes of finitude forever and vanish into infinite life. I bow to thee as the spoken voice of silent God. I bow to thee as the divine door which leads to the temple of salvation. I bow to thee, to thy master, Lahiri Mahashaya, harbinger of yoga in Benares, and I lay the flowers of my devotion at the feet of Babaji, our supreme master. As you know, uh, yesterday, April 21st, is the anniversary of Swami Kriyanandaji's passing, his Moksha Day. And this is a wonderful occasion to celebrate Swamiji's life. This is one of Ananda's newest holidays, if not its newest holiday. We're only just beginning to celebrate it. It's interesting how with many of the celebrations, for example, with Christmas, Master started an eight-hour meditation in 1930-something, I think, or maybe earlier than that. And from that time on, it has uh, continued all these years. But Swamiji left this world only to, in 2013, only, I guess that's five years ago, but it's, and it's been that many celebrations and of his life. It's obviously not a celebration of his passing. Some people were asking about, why do you celebrate the Guru's Ma Samadhi? Like, are you happy? And obviously it's not happy of the, his departure, but rather of his omnipresence. And it's an occasion to celebrate his presence in all of our lives, a presence that continues for those who are open to feeling it. And so the uh, the celebrations, as I said, have changed and varied, and I don't know if they'll take on one form or not in time, who knows. But uh, we tend not to go too much rigidly by a certain form. In fact, the Christmas meditation is one of the only customs I can think of at the moment for during a holiday. But for, um, for this day, and it really was a holy day, the day Swamiji left his body and one astrologer wrote and said all the planets and the nakshatras and everything were aligned for uh, the moksha of any soul who left the body at that time. And so Swamiji, even without consulting the ephemeris, picked the right time to leave from his point of view. From our point of view, there was no right time. I would rather have him here if I had my say in it, but I guess whatever emails I sent to Master were overlooked because he had it according to his own plan. And if we feel that sense, we, it was true for Master too. Master was telling people near the end of his life, I'm living on borrowed time. I, I, have, I was meant to leave 
some time ago, but I asked Divine Mother, keep me a little longer so I can finish up some important work. He was dicti, he was about to go out for a walk with the disciples, as was his custom, at a, in one particular evening near the end of his life, and then he said, stop. And he sat down and dictated this long commentary on uh, either on the scripture or on the spiritual teachings of this path. And then later he told to them, it was now or never. If we hadn't done it right now, it never would have happened. And that proved to be true. And so in this way, we uh, feel that though the master's time on earth is limited and finite and accessible in person only to a few, if you think of all the thousands who have been touched by Master's life, how few were able to meet him in person and how many more came to him after his passing. It is often the way with great Masters. And so we can look back through history and see great avatars. Their lives touched very few, but their enduring power, which is of course the power of God, continues to reach people and to enlighten people. That's just it. An avatar can, enlight, can enlighten, can liberate any number of thousands of souls because he or she can channel more of God's power on this earth. Otherwise, all masters are one. It isn't that someone who is not fully liberated yet of all past karma is any lesser of a saint. When you're one with God, you are God, master said once. But in terms of how much spiritual power they can bring, uh, the avatars come to start were uh, new missions, new religions, and so on, new pathways to God. And so on this day, we had a great celebration yesterday of Swamiji's life. And for those of you who were here, it was, it was very special, not just in terms of what we did together, but in terms of the presence of Swamiji that we felt so strongly that continues today. But also, in thinking of what to share of Swamiji today, uh, we were thinking it might be nice to read uh, something he had written, or read parts of it. Some years ago, an essay entitled, Why I Love My Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, because so much of Swamiji's work was in bringing master to people. He knew how important it was to share master with others. He knew how important it was as a disciple, and as, any, as all disciples, as he said, have this mission to make the guru real for others and to bring his living presence through their vibration, through sharing stories and so on. Swamiji was giving lectures uh, at master's request early on and he said early on into his time of meeting master and he had done it for seven years and during that time, meaning seven years into it, he still felt it really wasn't worth much. I mean, after all, he, he would, after a lecture, people would say, oh, I really liked your talk. And he would say, oh, what did I talk about? And he'd say, I really liked it. <laughs> they, and he was, he was disheartening that, well, my gosh, what are they even retaining? And so he also just... It was sort of the culture at Mount Washington. The sort of in thing to do was to sit and meditate in the monastery. And then there were those who had to go out into the world. And you know that was considered perhaps uh, a lesser duty by some. And certainly by he, by he, by Swamiji, he felt, oh, I don't know if I want to do this. In fact, there had been many uh, disciples of Master who had who had gone out into the public and lectured and just told their own story, their own thoughts, how they could improve on the teachings. And many of them had ended up leaving the path. And in fact, Master said that uh, this was the problem, that so many uh, uh, succumb to ego. So many of these ministers, these acharyas. And Swamiji said to Master, that's why I don't want to be a minister. That's why I don't want to lecture. And Master said, you will never fall due to ego. And so that, he said, was reassuring to hear. But he, um, as I said, was lecturing and so on and not thinking much of it. But then he especially, he said, when he came to India in 1958 and then to Bali, he was, uh, the people there 
said to him, we haven't ever heard of Yoganandaji Ji before. The autobiography of a yogi had been published. It had only been in circulation for uh, 13 years by then, but still, they said, we hadn't known Yoganandaji Ji before we heard you, but hearing of him from you, we have come to love him. And then Swamiji realized, he said, that the greatest thing he could bring people was Master's presence. I'm sure he was thinking that, feeling that before. His whole life was that before. But still, this gave, he said, meaning and purpose to his sharing with people. And so this is what he was dedicated to, bringing Master's presence to others. And it's interesting because Master said of him, if Walter had come sooner, that was his name for Swamiji, he said, we would have reached, by now we would have reached millions. And that's always something for me to contemplate because it isn't as if a uh, master needed help. I mean, when you're an avatar, you can create an extra galaxy if you want. You not enough people show up on Sunday. You can create a whole galaxy and determine that they'll all be devotees in this galaxy and they'll come on Sunday. And, you know, so you don't, it's not as if you need any particular help. And millions would only be even on one planet. So there's so many, so much work to do. But that Master did say that, so it showed us also, by extension, how the role Swamiji had to play. The Masters care just as much about bringing thousands to God as they care about bringing one. And that one is you. So remember that the Masters don't look in terms of quantity only, or even at all. But at the same time, they do want, as part of this rising age of Dwapara Yuga, for this new pathway to God, this new dispensation, this new ray of masters. Five avatars came to get it going. That's quite a lot. Normally you have one is enough <laughs> to start a whole new world work dedicated to God. And so, so in this then, uh, when we were thinking of what to share additionally of Swamiji's life today, we thought, well, what did Swamiji share? He shared Master. And these are a few thoughts that he writes in this essay. This is from the book Religion in the New Age and Other Essays. And this book, uh, if you don't own a copy of this book, you might like to get a copy for uh, a number of reasons, and one of them being that religion in the new age was the title of Swamiji's talk in Chennai. And so you sort of owe it to this book uh, <laughs> from all that has come from that one evening to the fact that any of us are in this room to this morning is from, the, uh, from that talk, Religion in the New Age. This was a very this is a, a sweet book for Darmini and me also because we were living with Swamiji in Gorgon at the time while he was writing this. And so he would come at, at for satsangs with a just printed out piece of paper. This is an essay I just finished. I'd like you all to hear and so on. And so we remember also when he shared this one. I think this was on Master's birthday, 2008 or nine. I think that he must be 2008 that he wrote this and then read it to everyone on Master's birthday. Friendship, Yogananda used to say, is the most rewarding human experience because it is a free gift without any compulsion. Even in mother's love, a certain compulsion exists, the compulsion of nature in the thought that her children are her own. Were some child of hers to die and be reborn next door, would she feel the same love for it? Not possessive love, certainly. Noble an institution as friendship is, however, it was not until I met my guru that I came to understand its higher octaves. As a divine friend, he was perfection itself. For friendship should be uplifting, and that is something it is not always. So long as the relationship is between two egos, it may only reinforce ego consciousness. Much can be said all the same in favor of ordinary human friendship, even when it only affects the ego. Experiments have been done on plants, showing that when a plant is given love, it flourishes, whereas if love is denied it, its growth becomes stunted by comparison. Moreover, if hate and rejection are directed at it, often 
wither, oh, sorry, it often withers and dies. Friendship is like that, even if it offers only ego balm. A healthy ego is much more to be desired than a crippled, sickly one, forever unsure of itself, inwardly wilting and cringing before everything and everybody. Though much, then, might be said of the possible negative influences of ordinary human friendship, basically it is something all human beings need. I have in this life been fortunate in many respects, but perhaps in none of them so much as in two inborn qualities. First, never to be influenced in my opinions of others by what they thought of me. And second, never to feel even tempted to justify myself, not to myself either, when I knew I was in the wrong. These qualities have been my strength. True friendship must spring not from need, but from inner strength. Only in this way can it be purely giving. One danger of friendship lies in the fact that friends want you to agree with them. Bad friends, consequently, want you to agree with and support them in error. As my guru put it, if you try to talk to them of higher things, they reply jovially, jovially, Oh, get off it! Come, have a drink! This is friendship? Too often, in other words, a person's apparent friends are actually enemies to his higher inter highest interests. As the Bhagavad Gita puts it, when the self is the friend of the self, it is its greatest friend. But when the little self is the enemy of the big self, it is its greatest enemy. A true friend is one who helps you to befriend that higher self. He supports everything that is best and truest for your highest welfare. He sympathizes with you and tries to understand your point of view. He will not condemn you hastily for any disagreement, nor separate himself from you in his sympathy, owing to any divergence of opinion. There are both dignity and mutual respect in such a, in a, such a relationship, and yes, a shared sense of fun also. For an ability to laugh kindly together is one way of sharing trust confidence, and mutual support. I hadn't the advantage in my childhood and youth of many close friendships, for I was never in one place long enough to form them. I did live till I was nine in Teliagin, Romania, but childhood friendships, friendships are often not deep, are not often deep, and many of my friends lived there just as temporarily as we did until their fathers were shifted further by their company. I spent a year and a half in Switzerland where I was ill most of the time. Six months following in Bucharest, again in Romania, and then two years at school in England. We moved to America in 1939 where I spent a year at Hackley School near Terrytown, New York, two years at Kent School in Connecticut, a year at Scarsdale High, two years at Haverford College, a year and a half at Brown University, a year in Charleston, South Carolina, and then Master and SRF, 14 years with the latter, 60 years so far with the former. Rod, my best friend in college, had a twofold influence on me, one for the good and the other for the not so good. He helped me to regain my self confidence when I needed it. Unfortunately, though brilliant, he had the fault of intellectual pride by which he infected me. My intellect being perhaps my strong point, it also became my weak link. Through all the years that followed, one of my truest and best of all possible friends was always my guru, Paramahansa Yogananda. He was true in every respect, the human quite as much as the divine. It's true that I couldn't joke with him in the familiar way friends enjoy with one another. Though I couldn't altogether express my sense of humor with him, I was too young not to be always in deep awe of him. For me, being with him was like being in the presence of God himself. Yet I asked him endless questions, more perhaps than anyone else. And he answered me, for he wanted me to understand. And if he joked with me, I, with my lively sense of humor, would joke back. Yet I couldn't help holding him at a certain distance, never quite sure of myself in his presence. 
That much said, he was with me not at all, the kind of stern disciplinarian he sometimes has been described being as being. He was kind, forgiving, endlessly and deeply understanding, supportive of all my, indeed of everyone's, human feelings and failings, not indeed of the failings themselves, but of us as people. I found him to be ever anxious to help us in our efforts to mature and to grow out of our every delusion. Once he scolded me for my involvement in a confrontation where I had felt righteously indignant. It took me a little while to adjust mentally to this volt face of, and I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, of being scolded for, as I saw it, doing right. But I said to him the next day, please, master, scold me more often. Looking at me deeply with heartfelt understanding, he answered, I understand, but that isn't what you need. You need more devotion. He also encouraged me in every little gain. Often no one else even noticed him doing so. One day he said to me lovingly, Keep on with your devotion, Walter. Just see how dry your life is when you depend on intellect. And one time, feeling intensely my separation from him, I went to Encinitas, where he had gone for a visit, on purpose to see him. As soon as we met, he responded kindly, I have missed you, Walter. That evening, David Smith, a brother disciple, involved us in worldly chatter, and my devotion slipped. When I saw Master the next day, he tugged at a lock of my hair lightly and reminded me with the same loving smile, though with a hint of reproof, I have missed you. It pains me when I hear people say coldly, Master wouldn't have approved of that. Master wouldn't tolerate disorder. Master was always a strict taskmaster. These things have been said to justify the disciples' own lack of kindness, sympathy, and simple humane charity. But I remember one time, I've quoted it elsewhere in these essays, where he came, when he came into the monk's dining room and found it was an utter, in utter embarrassing chaos. His only comment then was, well, it might be worse. In his treatment of the other disciples, I never saw him speak to them harshly. In fact, I wonder whether their impression of harshness didn't come from their own rebellious egos. The few times he scolded me, I saw only regret in his eyes for having to speak strongly to me. He did so for my benefit purely. There was a period in Diamata's discipleship, she told me, when he scolded her almost daily. She resented it, especially because his manner was then so different from what he had shown her when she first came. One evening she prayed, from now on, Divine Mother, I will direct my love first to you. When she went indoors for his blessing, he tapped her lightly on the top of her head and murmured approvingly, very good. The scoldings stopped. He had wanted to break her of an excessively human attachment to him. With those who were not disciples, he was affability itself, kindly, warm, entirely accepting, and forgiving of any insult or calumny. I remember one time, I mentioned this occasion in my book, The New Path, at a public function, a man from India was quite tipsy and treated Master with a familiarity no one else would have ever dreamed of, putting his arms around Master, laughing jovially, and talking familiarly. Debbie, a, a Bengali disciple, ridiculed the man to Master in Bengali, a language unknown to this Indian, for his inebriation. Don't, Master scolded him quietly, so that the man himself wouldn't notice. Master saw this man in the full dignity of a human being, not as someone who, in his drunkenness, had lost that dignity. Another time, the Master, as he was entering a hotel, was approached by a drunken stranger who embraced him and cried, Hello, Jesus Christ! Master, hello, Master responded affably, then shared with him a touch of the inner bliss he himself was experiencing. Shay, what are you drinking? demanded the man. I can tell you it has a lot of kick in it, the Master replied. 
He then touched this man on the forehead, leaving him sober, though perhaps somewhat bewildered. These are stories I have shared before elsewhere. Here is another one. A member of the Indian community came to Mount Washington with Ambassador Benai R. Sen, just days before Master left his body. This Indian lived in Los Angeles and had devoted years to persecuting the Master by spreading untruths about him. At a certain moment that afternoon, the two of them were briefly alone together. Master said to the man, Remember, I will always love you. Herbert Freed, a brother disciple, overheard the Master's words. A photograph of Master taken at that moment shows the visitor's expression. It reveals a mixture of emotions, wonder, shame, perhaps dismay at his own pettiness. For those who understand the inwardness of that moment, it is a dramatic photograph. It was this episode, incidentally, that gave me the inspiration for my one-act play, The Jewel in the Lotus. The Master simply accepted people as they were, with never a breath of criticism, but always with love. It often surprised me to see the completeness of his acceptance. People whom I myself might have turned away from with distaste, Master treated kindly and with a gentle, though always dignified, smile. Not everyone understood him by any means. I'll never forget a neighbor of the Master's at 29 Palms when that man gave one of my brother disciples his view. Master used to share fruits with him, an act of generosity that to this man seemed beyond comprehension. One day, speaking of Master, one day he said, speaking of Master, you know, he's a little making a circular movement to indicate someone a little touched in the head, but he added admiringly, he's got a heart of gold. The Master was a true friend to everybody, seeing all as his very own. That is why, wherever he went, he always found people friendly and eager to help him. Yet, when someone came to him and asked to be accepted as a disciple, he saw his re responsibility as a divine friend to be the highest type of friend he could be to that person. In this sense, he might be compared to a divine fisherman, never letting the line get too tight, but if it slackened, testing it to see how forcefully he could reel it in without letting it break. He was infinitely kind to us, forgiving, supportive, gentle, humorous, one with us in friendship, and ever completely loving. Yet he was also careful always to turn our minds and aspirations toward our own highest potential in God. Never did I see him come down from that high purpose. And always in his calm gaze, I saw a complete absence of ego motive, including the slightest impulse either to act or react personally. People, men perhaps especially, who lack personal motivation are often misunderstood by others, bound as almost all people are by personal desires. Master had many self-styled enemies who fancied they saw in him someone dark, someone scheming for subtle hidden ends, which he was not frank enough to admit openly, and, must wit and which must therefore, so they imagined, have been all the more sinister. I think it was his very strength they feared. Their fears, however, were nothing but projections of a darkness in their own natures. Perhaps it was his strength also that made some of the disciples think of him as harsh. Otherwise, I can't imagine how anyone saw him as anything but a strong bulwark, supportive always of our true needs. No, I think those disciples too simply hadn't the humility or the sensitivity to see in him the truest divine friend they would or could ever have. Only consider his poem, God's Boatman. In that poem he promised to come back, if need be, a trillion times, so long as one stray brother sits weeping by the wayside. Think of it. There was no personal necessity for him to return to this material plane. He came here out of a purely selfless desire to bring others out of delusion and lead them back to God's kingdom. 
How many times I have often wondered has he returned to earth already in perfect freedom. I have good reason to believe that he has been coming back for many thousands of years and always with the same purpose and with the same universal love. He himself often told us, I killed Yogananda long ago. Only God lives in this temple now. And I heard him declare also, I was freed many lifetimes ago. Think of it. The vast majority of souls who achieve oneness with God are satisfied never to emerge from that blissful state again. Divine bliss is too perfectly satisfying to them, and they suffered enough before attaining it. All they want now is eternal, complete rest in the Lord. What did our Guru want from us? Nothing. Nothing, that is, but our highest good. Could any friend be more perfect, more dear, more wonderful than that? When I met him, he said to me, I give you my unconditional love. No treasure could be greater, surely, than that sacred promise. He has fulfilled it in countless ways. More and more through the years, I have found him mentally guiding me, leading me toward final inner freedom, filling me with inner bliss. He hasn't made the way easy, unless indeed I consider, as I do, that every hardship has become, in the end, a supernal blessing. No, I can think of no experience in my life that has not ended in sweetness, in an expansion of love, and in deep gratefulness. Forgiveness for wrongs, hurts, betrayals, tests? All I can say is, what tests, what betrayals, what hurts, what wrongs? They were never wrongs personally to me. In all my dealings with Master in the body, I always knew he was on my side, not against anyone or anything else, but supportive of me in all my struggles toward perfection. He responded supportively to my least thought. If I was wrong, he said so in such a way that only I, if others were present, could know what he was talking about. He never blurted out anything. All his words were carefully measured so as to be as understandable and acceptable to me as possible. There was, as I said, a dignity about him that was completely innate and natural. He was indeed a king among men, and I think most people felt it instinctively. And everything I ever saw him do or heard him say was completely appropriate to the occasion. Tara, a sister disciple, once remarked to me about him, Every time I think I've understood him, I find he's much more than that. I didn't say so to her, but I was astonished that anyone could even think of understanding him. To me, it seemed like trying to understand the ocean. His friendship for each of us was deeply personal, yet he was, for each of us, like a window onto infinity inviting us to come outside and merge in that vastness. I love my guru, as he himself wrote about his own guru, Swami Sri Yukteswar, as the spoken voice of silent God. He was ever, and is now more than ever, my nearest, dearest companion. If I am right, I feel his inner smile. If I am wrong, I feel his inner encouragement to do better. He is on my side in every struggle against delusion. Could anyone be a better, truer friend than that? Wasn't that a beautiful reading? It's just really us talking about Master and Swamiji and all the Masters. I know when I'm inwardly praying very often I'll think, okay, who am I praying to? Am I praying to Master? Am I praying to Swamiji? Am I praying to Divine Mother? And I'll just try and feel what's going on there. And sometimes I can tell that I'm talking to Master. Sometimes I can tell I'm talking to, to Swamiji. I shouldn't say sometimes. Always I can tell who I'm talking to if I think about it. But very often they're all grouped together too. <laughs> And then at times I include all the other masters also. 
<laughs> so <laughs> I don't ever want to leave anyone out. And um, I, I was very much feeling Divine Mother at one point. And I thought, oh, uh, I was looking at my emails at the time and that uh, this day in Paramahansa Yoganandaji's um, life email. If, you're, if you don't have a subscription to that, you might want to get it. Let us know, we can forward it to you, you can subscribe. It has, every day you get an email that has activities of master. And I felt so immersed in Divine Mother, I thought, oh, I don't want to read anything then I thought, am I leaving Master out of this? What's going on? So then I read that email, and then it was like, no, <laughs> everybody is together. <laughs> so, so there's no worries there. You'll, you'll feel the delineation if there needs to be one. Uh, otherwise, you can feel them together as well. So um, definitely when I took discipleship, it felt like it was to master, that master was the guru of this path. But nothing prevents us from communicating with everybody. <laughs> I think the sat guru is one guru who takes us under his wing and says, I'm going to free you someday. And so that is Yoganandaji, and yet, Swamiji came and he uh, felt like Yoganandaji. He communicated who Yoganandaji was in so many beautiful ways. And Ananda over the years has been challenged as an organization in representing Master. And we've had to fight to have a place at the table, if you want to put it that way fight to have the photos of Yoganandaji even on our altar. We were threatened with a lawsuit, well we had a lawsuit, where they were trying to prevent us from having Yoganandaji on the altar. And Swamiji had to really say, no, this is who we are. We are devotees of Yoganandaji. There are many who are not just part of one organization who can be represent the guru. And so there was a time, and it, has, it, it was really around the time I came in, in the very early 90s that we were in the midst of that fight. And at the time, uh, many people left Ananda. Uh, they, they felt disturbed that we would be involved in such a thing even though it wasn't, we were not the ones who initiated this lawsuit. And, but it really helped define Ananda. Yoganandaji said, this spiritual path is not for the weak of heart. It's not for those who want to just pretend everything is light and fuzzy and soft and gentle and we float around and Hello, God bless you. Hello, you know. Um, <laughs> today's affirmation was humility. <laughs> and so Swami's like, okay, yes, we need to be humble. Just be real about it, okay? <laughs> but Ananda really had to define itself during that time. And, um, and it was good. At that time, we had communities throughout the US and also in Europe. We hadn't even um, gotten to South America yet. Not much Mexico, South America stuff going on. Now we were all over the world. It was as though that persecution, for some, if, if they had a weak situation, like it wasn't meant to be, that kind of persecution would shrink them and make them disappear. But that persecution made us bloom. Swamiji always said that made us stronger. Uh, we had to say, yes, you know, I am a disciple of Master. Yes, this is a true path. Yes, um, there are saints that exist on this path. 
And a saint is the truest uh, evidence that a path is working when you have saints on the path. Um, I wanted to mention something that occurred to me this morning when I was thinking about when I met Swamiji. When I was in my early 20s, I really was focused on being an engineer. I, I was materialistic at the time. I didn't have much meaning in my life, so what else do you go for? Uh, engineering. I was good at math, good at science, and uh, to me it seemed kind of obvious. At one point I wanted to be a microsurgeon, and I even used to watch open heart surgery with my fellow medical uh, devotees who wanted to do it. We went to a hospital and saw that. and I don't know. Some, somehow my materialism took over because with engineering you could get educated a lot faster and make a lot of money <laughs> soon. That's just where my mind was. I'm not quite sure why. Um, when I've had a reading with the naughty guy, he said you were really focused on just uh, stabilizing your life. So, fine. Um, and, and so I did, but I didn't have much meaning at all in my life. But uh, I remember when I thought about what should my life be, you know, one might think, oh, you see family and children happening and looking into the future, what might happen? I remember I could never figure out what was going to happen in my life after my mid-twenties. I, I couldn't feel my life. And I often told friends, I wonder if I'm going to die early. And I don't even know if I, did I ever tell you this? Yeah. <laughs> I haven't thought about it in so long. And I, I really, I wasn't afraid, but I just thought, so strange. I, I just don't feel my life in my later, you know, right after my mid-twenties was when I found Ananda. But I couldn't feel anything. I thought, well, you would think I could feel a long, successful career, or when will I find my mate to finally get married and have a family, all that kind of stuff. I, I, ne I could never feel it. And then when I found Ananda, it was... <coughs> Uh, the death of materialism for me. It was a materialistic death. And it was a good death to have. Um, and so now I, in hindsight, of course, I understand why I couldn't see my life because it was completely opposite of what I was living at the time, almost. It wasn't like I was living a bad life. But certainly the awakening that has to happen that turns you from just pursuing money I mean, I was involved in music and friendships and things like that, and I was a liberal person and believed in helping humanity and things like that, but I was not spiritual. I, I well, no, I should say I, w I was spiritual, but I, I had not found a path, and I didn't know what my path was. But then I found Swamiji and Yoganandaji, and that really was just the death of it all. And I think a part of me recognized that, felt afraid of it, felt the pull of something, and, um, but it won. <laughs> it won and, and pulled me in, thank goodness. Because you would think, you know, if, if we've been yogis in past lives, we could just be born into yogi families and we all meditate together and, um, you know, then, transition into the yogi life, but my life was not meant to be that way. None of our lives are meant to be other than what they are. We should never feel as though, oh, I wish my family was this way or my life was that way. We're given what we're, we need to have. People will say, you know, I'm, I'm married, but my spouse isn't involved in what I want, I'm doing, and, um, you know, Every situation we have is perfect. Perfect for us to be where we are now. 
It's perfect. It's the way it should be so we can find our freedom. We've already surrendered. Most everyone in here is probably a devotee of some sort or a, or a disciple, at least in their heart. Um, everything is just as it should be. Think about that at some point in your next meditation. All the things we resist in life, all the situations we have that we resist, all the different people that we resist. Think about what it would be like if we didn't resist it anymore. If we just accepted things as they are, how would we be different? How would we, how, how could our hearts soften a bit? How could we then surrender to God more deeply? These are the ways that Swamiji lived. Swamiji didn't resist. You could, he wasn't passive either. He was, he was not passive at all. But he didn't resist and deny and try and push things away. He was very self-honest, very honest about everything going on in his life. Such an open person, such an authentic person. Uh, when you were in his presence, you felt, I have to be honest. I have to be completely honest. I can't, I, it, it was like he was shining a light and that light required you to be self-honest. And it, and it was good. You know, sometimes he could tell if there was something you were ashamed about and he would bring it up. <laughs> Probably more to those, I, I like to tell myself he, he would say that to people who he knew could take it because very often he would say things to me that I was embarrassed about to bring it out into the open. Um, one of my relatives drinks a lot of alcohol. And uh, growing up, it was not easy with that person. They weren't doing it yet. But then uh, in the later years, they were. And so I had written to Swamiji about this, like, please pray for this person. And then we were at a lunch. <laughs> and Swamiji brought it up in front of everybody. <laughs> And I thought, I felt what it was, was he wanted others to get to know me. And so he wanted to just bring up something personal going on in my life so that they could get to know that. <laughs> because a lot of the people at the table were old, a lot older than I was, and they didn't know me. And so, so he brought that up, and I, I felt embarrassed. And then I thought, I'm going to surrender to this because my guru has just brought this up into the light. And perhaps bringing it up, these people could then pray for it. I was keeping it quiet and silent. And, um, and these people could pray for, for this person's benefit. I, I do feel it was for the best, but it was a bit like taking a shot. And there were a number of incidents like that. And, uh, but when, when it was coming from Swamiji, I just thought, this has to be. I know he cares about um, my um, progress on the spiritual path. I know he cares about that. And I know everything he is saying and does comes from that. And many of you here may feel like, oh, I just come to Ananda, but you don't know how aware we are of you. You don't know how much we love each one of you. We are aware of you. You think you come. You think, uh, oh, it's getting too big. They don't know us anymore. That's not true. We are aware of you. This is our job, is to be aware of you and to have that love flow through. So even though we are going away to America, we are very much attached to you. So please don't feel as though, oh, they're away, they're not going to think of us. We will be thinking of you. We keep you in our prayers. <coughs> this is the most fulfilling thing we've ever done in our lives, is to be here in Chennai. 
and to be able to feel the presence of the masters so strongly, like we all do. It's a very powerful room, feel it. Feel how strong the presence is right now in this moment. Feel how Divine Mother is filling our hearts. Feel how Swami and Master are here, filling this room. Sri Yukteswarji, who just gave us that photo. We're so blessed. So this uh, talk, I guess, turned in more into a being rather than a talk. <laughs> so we are ever grateful to be here with you all. And um, when we're away, keep in touch. And keep in touch, keep your meditation practice up. I remember uh, in my early days in Palo Alto, periodically I'd go running to the acharyas with emotional issues. And one said, who's a very close friend, she said, you know, you always have these problems when David and Asha go out of town. <laughs> I thought, really? <laughs> <laughs> I was there for 12 years. I think she was there except for my last two years. And so, um, so anyway, anyway uh, keeping the meditation practice up while we're away helps really keep things strong. Come on Thursday nights, come on Saturday mornings, the, the Kriya Bonds. Uh, there's a Kriya Bond meditation Saturday mornings. The center is open. You can just come and meditate anytime you want. Call Prasanna first, make sure he's not on an errand or depositing something in the bank or taking something out of the bank. <laughs> <laughs> he won't be here if, if you're, you just come. So make sure you call him. The first week is going to be a bit off because he's helping us on Monday and normally that's his day off. So. Um, we're, we're trying to wrap a few things up before we go. So, I guess there's not much more I can say, is there? <laughs> ah, good idea. So, we are about to have um, some pilgrim vows said. Uh, Dharmarajan gave the class on Wednesday night's renunciate order class. And so those who attended that class and prepared um, are going to be taking the pilgrim vow. And um, so are we going to do it like a discipleship or? Okay. Okay.